Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's great to have you guys here at church. Let's all stand together. Uh, so good to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm Brenton. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I thought it'd be great for us to begin uh, by reading just a short verse from Psalm 105, verse 4. It says, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. And uh, for you, this might be one of your first Sundays here, or you may have been here for a hundred Sundays or more, but God is calling us to seek Him. And, and that word seek uh, has the meaning of to, to frequent a familiar place, to tread a familiar path, to come again over that uh, familiar, well-worn place. And, you know, each Sunday we have the chance to do that, to come again together as the people of God and to gather. And, and God desires to give us His strength and to fill us with His Spirit. But He also desires for us to, um, to come to Him, to seek Him, to come after Him once again and ask of Him uh, for His strength and for His guidance in our life. And so, man, it's wonderful to be here with all of you today. And I'd love for us to pray together and just ask the Lord for that. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we pray that you would uh, provide us with your strength as we seek after you again today, coming again for many of us to this familiar path, uh, a Sunday morning in your presence, in your church. Lord, we admit that we are weak, we are frail, we uh, get tired and fatigued in our heart and our mind and our physical bodies. And Lord, we need a strength that is uh, from you for this life. And so we pray for that, God. Would you uh, work in that way in our lives this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips.
There's just something about it that fills my heart with joy. There's just something about His name. Only one that I worship, only one I adore, only one my heart will praise. There's just something about His name. Jesus, lift up Jesus, sing the name that overcomes. Savior, He has freed us. Lift up Jesus, lift Him up. He's a river of mercy. He's the fountain of life. All my sins are washed away. He's the reason I'm singing. He's my song in the night. He's been faithful all my days. There's just something about His name. Sing it together. Oh, Jesus, lift up Jesus. Sing the name that overcomes. Savior, Savior, He has freed us. Lift up Jesus. sing it out. The Savior, Savior, He has freed us. Lift up Jesus, lift Him up. Oh, Jesus, lift up Jesus. Sing the name that overcomes. Celebrate Jesus together. We praise your name, Lord. We lift you up today. You are worthy of all praise. The only one we worship, the only one we adore today, God. We thank you for being here with us. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, we're going to continue to worship some more in a moment. But uh, right now, would you see who's standing next to you? Say good morning. Say hello. And then you can take a seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Janine, and I've been here at Calvary about six years, and I count it such a privilege to be able to come every morning, uh, to be able, every Sunday morning, I'm not here every morning, (laughs) every Sunday morning uh, to worship the Lord. Um, And I just count it 
an awesome opportunity to be able to meet so many new people. So hopefully, as you were meeting and greeting one another, you made a new friend, um, especially if you're new or you're visiting with us. We would love to get to know you, um, and by doing so, at our Welcome Center. We've got a gift that we'd love to give you and um, just take the opportunity to share with you more about what's going on uh, here at our church and also to hear about what's going on in your life. So we're just glad that you're here and hope to visit with you at the Welcome Center after service. Another awesome opportunity that this church uh, provides is the life group ministry. And many of you, actually, how many of you are in a life group this quarter? That's awesome. I'm so excited to see how so many of you have just taken advantage of this opportunity to meet weekly um, to grow in your faith with one another. Uh, if you didn't raise your hand, you actually still have the opportunity to do that. Uh, we have a few weeks left of life groups, and there's a mid-quarter group that meets here at the church weekly. Um, so if you are interested in finding out more about that, you can text find a life group to 41411. We have a few other things going on in our church, and let's turn our attention to the screen to find out more. Hey church, my name is Riley. I'm the leader for our young adult ministry here at Calvary. And I just wanna take a moment to share with you some of the things that are coming up here at our church. One of the big questions that every Christian has to ask themselves is what church am I gonna be a part of? And if you're new to Calvary, then we wanna invite you out to intro to Calvary to help you make a decision on whether or not you wanna really call Calvary Monterey your church home. At Intro to Calvary, uh, we share with you our vision as a church, our mission as a church, and we allow you to make some connections with the pastors and some key leaders in the church just to give you a taste of what we're all about. And so if you are new, please come out this Tuesday to Intro to Calvary. We're gonna have kids care available. We're gonna have some food available as well. All we ask is that you sign up online uh, to let us know that you're coming so we can prepare for you. But if you are new, we hope to see you out on Tuesday night for Intro to Calvary. The second part of our mission statement is to nurture believers. And we do that through life groups, but we also do that through training. And one of the training resources that we wanted to give you today is Right Now Media. You've heard us talk about this before, but we just want to put it in front of you again that Right Now Media is this amazing online collection of videos and resources designed to help you with the everyday situations in your life. Maybe you have questions about parenting, or about marriage, or maybe you're unmarried and wondering how to live your life best for the Lord, or maybe you're a student or a graduate and you're looking for some direction in your life. Maybe you have questions about finances or how to hold yourself in your work environment. All kinds of things uh, can be covered in the library of Right Now Media. And so to get these videos, it is super easy. So all you have to do is go to calvary.com slash resources, click the Right Now Media button, and then fill out the little survey that you're prompted to fill out. It'll take you straight to the library. And it is 100% free. None of this stuff comes with any charge. It's our gift to you. We wanna see you grow in your faith and in your knowledge of God's word. So jump on these videos, and I promise you that as you jump into them and let them get into your life, as you let God's word get into your mind, that you will be strengthened, you will be encouraged, and you will be equipped to go out and do everything that God has called you to do. So as we continue to worship through singing, we'll also have the opportunity to worship through giving. If you are new or visiting with us today, please do not feel obligated to give. As the ushers come forward, let us take a moment to prepare our hearts to continue in worship. Father, you are so good to us. We want to claim your promise this morning that wherever two or three are gathered, there you are. We know that even in these few moments as we've begun worship, Lord, that you've been stirring in our hearts. And so we pray you would continue this work. We pray that that which is given today physically and spiritually, Lord, you would bless and you would multiply. Father, we 
are just so in all of you this morning. And we pray that you would continue to bless this time of worship. We pray these things in your name. Amen. We need no other hiding place. A hope is safe within your name. This we know, this we know. You promise never to forsake. What you began, you will sustain. This we know, this we know. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Of the heavens and the earth Announce the fullness of your word This we know This we know And every enemy will flee As we declare your victory This we know shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain then I will call upon the Lord for he alone is strong enough to save rise your shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Let's lift up the name of Jesus this morning. In Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call His name. In Jesus'
I spoke a word You were singing over me You have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me In all of the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves at 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God When I was your foe, still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me You have been so, so kind to me In all oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves at 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. You won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. And oh, the overwhelming, never ending red. Love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found these to 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless.
God, we thank you this morning for that love that pursues us, that seeks after us. We lean upon you. We trust in you this morning. Sing my hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. Trust in Jesus' name. Sing that again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest frame. in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Darkness seemed to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. that if we build our house upon the rock when the storms of life come we'll stand but if we build our lives on the sand when the storms come the house will sink and Lord Jesus you've been the greatest cornerstone foundation that we could ever build our lives upon and we pray and ask that you'd help us to continue Lord to do so we also Lord, just want to thank you for the love that you've given to us, the grace that you've given to us. Lord, we know that we're not here because of what we've done, but because of what you've done. We know that we don't love you because we first loved you, but because you first loved us. 
And we thank you, Lord, for your perfect and pure and selfless love for us as your people. And we pray, Lord, that you'd remind us and refresh us in that love and grace today. And Father, for the people that you put in our lives, people that we love, we ask, Lord, that ever increasingly they would know of the love of God for them. And Lord, that they would sense it and realize it and see it in the cross of Jesus. So, Father, thank you for what you've given to us. Thank you for this great foundation that we are standing upon. And we pray, Lord, that you deepen our walk, deepen our faith. This morning, we pray as you meet us here together by your spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. All right, you may be seated, church. Good morning. It's great to see you guys. So we're going through um, the book of Hebrews together, and uh, today we're in Hebrews chapter seven, uh, uh, 11, our 17th study in the book of Hebrews. So if you turn to Hebrews chapter 11 this morning, and if you need a Bible, you could raise your hand in the air and we'll get one to you. But Hebrews chapter 11, and today we'll be in verse 17 to 22, so a smaller section this morning. And as you're turning there, I just want to rejoice for a second about our Easter service and week that we had last week. It was just, wasn't that fun last week? That was just such a a blessing. And uh, I I enjoyed it. I I, I enjoyed it on a lot of different levels. One one being, I think it was good for uh, our community. And I think in the years to come, because I'd like to do it again, I think it could be a real blessing for our community in the years to come. I kind of had a vision for how that could be. And then I think it was good for um, us as a church on many levels, but one being all of us getting to be together in one church service. That was kind of nice. One location, one church service together. But then also you know, I I encourage you to submit names that you want prayed for and people you'd like to invite and things like that. And many of you did that, but it also, after now the first one, you have a vision for what that would look like, what you're bringing someone to if you were to invite someone uh, in the future and years to come. So I like that. And then I also liked it for our leadership team. It was a lot of work, and uh, they were very thorough. I thought they did a fantastic job. I just kept telling people over and over again, yeah, you can <laughs> celebrate them for sure. I just kept telling people over and over again, my role in it was to say yes to the fairgrounds and prepare a sermon. And I was just as surprised as you guys were <laughs> when I got there. I mean, it was just like, man, this is incredible. They did such a great job. So it was a real blessing, I think, for our leadership team to get a vision for different things that God could do. And then, finally, I think in the Godward direction, both with the Good Friday service and our Easter service, there's just nothing um, gimmicky, but it's just God-honoring. And I think that he, you know, he loves our worship. He loves our praise. And he loves when we, we're doing it as best we possibly can. And so I, I think that he was honored through what we said, the way we sang, and just our, the way we gathered together all weekend long. So... That was just a blessing, and thanks for being a part of it. And those of you who served a little bit at it or a lot at it, thank you so much for helping out because it was definitely a lot of work, but uh, but a great blessing. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, though, is where we're at today. And I'm just going to pray a prayer of thanksgiving to God for last week, but also ask that he'd meet us here in his word today. So, Father... um, We just take a moment to quiet our hearts before you and say thank you, Lord. Thank you for uh, blessing us so much as we, you know, in a sense, attempted to bless you, Lord, last week and celebrate you. You poured into us in the process, and we thank you, Lord, for that. And we thank you for just a great week to celebrate your Passion Week and your resurrection and just the, the ways that you spoke and ministered to our hearts. Lord, we just loved that. And so thank you so much for meeting us uh, as a church last week. And we also, Lord, pray today as we get into your word here in Hebrews chapter 11 that you would speak to us, that you'd teach us these four patriarchs, Lord, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We pray, Lord, that 
the elements of their faith that they had, that they become, Lord, part of our lives as well today. Minister to us, Lord, teach us, we pray from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, verse 17, let's read it all together. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. That was God speaking. Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He, being Abraham, considered that God was able even to raise him, Isaac, from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Then in verse 20, we get our next character. So that first one was Abraham. Now we have Isaac. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. Then in verse 21, our next character, Jacob, it says, By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. And then finally, our fourth character, verse 22, By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Now, You can learn a lot from people by the way they behave at the very end of their lives. You can learn a lot from people by what they say at the very end of their lives. And for those who are listening and ready to receive, you can receive great benefit from the way that people lived and spoke at the end of their lives for your life today. And I think that's part of what we get from looking at these Four characters, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph in this great chapter on faith, Hebrews chapter 11. Now, it's been a while since we've been in the book of Hebrews, so I'll give you a reminder that the author is writing to a group of Jewish Christians who were experiencing some persecution and were being marginalized because of their Christianity. In other words, because they'd accepted Jesus as the Messiah, the families that they'd grown up in, the communities that they were comfortable in, no longer wanted to receive them. And they were being tempted because of this pressure to walk away from Jesus or to add to Jesus the Old Testament sacrificial system. It was an uncomfortable moment that they were going through in that stage of their Christian life and experience. And so the author built a case in this whole letter to tell them, no, 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 no. What you have in Jesus is better than what you had in Judaism. And what you have in Jesus is better than all of those traditions. And so hold on to Jesus. Hold on to your confession and do not neglect it. And he got to a point in chapter 10 where he became really practical about the whole thing. And he just said, look, the pressure's coming. The difficulty's coming. There have been those who suffered persecution, and you will likely also suffer persecution as well. So he gave them a game plan. He said, find a bunch of other Christians and meet with them all the time because you're going to need each other. You're going to need that mutual encouragement. He said that confession that you've received, write it down, hold on to it, and don't Bend from it, don't turn from it to the right or left, but but hold on to that confession. And then he told them as well, he said, and learn how to live a life of endurance by living a life of faith. It's going to be a life of faith that gets you through this life of difficulty. And so in chapter 11, he expanded on that idea. You want to hear about the life of faith, he's saying to his readers? I'll explain it to you by going back to the Old Testament and showing you the kind of life that faith can produce. And so we've seen character after character. We've looked at Abel and Enoch and Noah. And as we've gone through all these different characters, we've learned different things that faith is and faith does. And a couple of weeks ago, we were introduced to a man named Abraham. He's called in the Bible the father of faith. He's an incredible character. And what we saw a couple of weeks ago was the faith of Abraham to believe a promise that God made to him that was astounding and incredible. God said to this man Abraham, 
through your seed, your ancestry, or uh, your genealogy, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And he said this to this man before he'd had even one child. So it was an incredible promise. Abraham believed that promise, and God accounted it to him for righteousness. And that promise ultimately was fulfilled through Jesus. Eventually, Jesus came uh, as an offspring uh, and in Abraham's family, and Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection leads to the potential blessing of all nations, people in every nation who believe, who place their faith and trust in and on Jesus Christ. So that's what we saw about Abraham a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago. But today we come to this other element of Abraham's life that the author wants to say this also was an aspect of Abraham's faith. Now, in setting the stage for this element of his faith, what you have to remember is that he received that promise from God and then a long time went by before he had any children. And it became tempting to take matters into their own hands. He and his wife, Sarah, couldn't have any children, it seemed. And so Sarah concocted the idea, hey, why don't you take our servant, uh, our maidservant, her, her name was Hagar, and you know, do the customary thing of our day and have a child with her. She'll kind of be our surrogate. And the, whatever child she has, that will be the fulfillment of God's promise. And Abraham went along with that plan. They had a boy named uh, Ishmael. But God confirmed that Ishmael would, was rejected, that he was not the promised seed. And he said, you guys, Abraham, Sarah, you will have a child together. And we looked at that a few weeks ago. Now, at the point of this episode, though, it, Isaac, now who's been born, he's now full grown and, you know, probably in his 20s or his 30s, and this is what it says. Let's read it together again in verse 17. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, though through Isaac, your offspring shall be named. He considered that God was able even to raise Isaac, him, from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. This is exactly what happened in Genesis chapter 22. So, look, there are none of us here today who read this and say, first of all, there's none of us who say, I wish I was Abraham and God would test my faith like that. <laughs> Nobody feels that way. Also, there's none of us who think, that's, that's a lovely thing that God asked Abraham to do. It's gruesome to us. It's astounding. It seems archaic, ar archaic, barbaric. We don't like it. We don't like it. Now, the culture that Abraham lived in, the one he came from, Ur, and the one he was going to, Canaan, both of those cultures historically practiced child sacrifice. They believed in deities that wanted the sacrifice of children. Abraham, when you go back to Genesis chapter 22, seems to have understood that God was not going to ultimately require the death of Isaac. He told the servants that were there that day, he said, I and the boy are going to go and we will come to you. So there seems to be a sense in Abraham's mind and heart that, hey, we're coming back, we together are coming back from this. Isaac asks the question, Father, I see the fire and I see the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham told him, God himself will provide the lamb. The way that I always have read that is that God will provide himself to be the lamb. But it's gruesome what God, at first glance, was asking Abraham to do. I think two things are at play here. I think, for one, God is trying to communicate to Abraham in a very jarring and shocking way, I ultimately don't want what all these false gods all around you want. You're heading into this like it's normal. It's not normal. I don't want that. I'm not going to ultimately require 
that of you. I am not like these other gods. But I think a second thing that is at play here is that it's almost like we are supposed to be abhorred by this. We are supposed to say, that is terrible that there was even the idea that a son would be sacrificed so that God could then turn around to us and say, yes, I agree with you, but that's how much I love you. I will give my son, and my son will volunteer himself to substitute himself for you. It is terrible. Do not take it lightly, but this is great love that I have for you. This is certainly and surely the only way that you can be saved. And my son would sacrifice himself for you. But if we could just set all of that aside for a second and look at the faith that Abraham displayed and asked the question, what was happening here in this episode for Abraham? What was God trying to do in Abraham? It says in this passage and also in the Genesis 22 passage that God was testing Abraham. So how did this test go? Well, think about it. There were two things that Abraham was totally sure of when this episode unfolded in his life, all right? Here's thing number one. This is what Abraham knew. God told him, that the promise that he'd made to Abraham would not be fulfilled through Ishmael, but would be fulfilled through Isaac, right? And and at the point that God asked for Isaac's sacrifice, Isaac had no children. So it's not like he could die and still the promise would pass through his line. No, he had to live long enough to have some babies, right? That, That was the bottom line. So Abraham knew, the first thing he knew, God He said, he promised it's going to happen through Isaac. Then the second thing he knew was that God commanded him, told him, to kill Isaac. These are like contradictory things. This is, they they don't go together. They, They are competing against one another. Here's what Abraham concluded, though. His conclusion was, God made a promise. He's got to take care of that. God told me to do something. I got to take care of that. In other words, God takes care of the promise. I take care of the obedience. And if you were to ask Abraham on that day, well, how's that going to work out? The text tells us that Abraham considered that God was even able to raise Isaac from the dead. That's how strongly he believed in the promise of God. He says, well, If this actually happens, God made the promise. It's going to happen through Isaac. So Isaac's got to live, so God's going to raise him back from the dead. Now, that's wild faith, don't you think? This is part of the reason he's the father of faith, and we're, like, happy to let him be that today. We're like, okay, you can have that title. But you have to remember, he believed this about God before he had any Bible stories that taught him about resurrection. He believed this before there were any Bible characters, Jesus or otherwise, who came back to life. He had no examples of this. And that's how strongly he believed in the promise of God. In a sense, it's like we could say, look, if if Abraham was able to take these things that felt contradictory and still obey God. There is nothing in our lives that will ever come about in our lives that where we know what God tells us to do, we also know what God has promised, and it feels contradictory, and we have an excuse to say, I'm not gonna go with it because, and I'm not gonna obey because it just, it doesn't feel right to me. If Abraham obeyed the Lord in this kind of way, it shows us this first thing we're seeing through Abraham is that faith obeys God. Faith obeys God. Faith obeys God no matter what. Because it believes God no matter what. This is where Abraham had come to. He said, God, you have to take care of the promise. I will take care of the obedience. You see, God had been faithful to Abraham in the past God had provided for him, defended him. He had opened up doors for him. He would fulfilled his promises to Abraham in the past. But here, he learned 
in a massive way that God is trustworthy. In fact, what happened was God stopped the whole thing and said, hey, you know, I know your faith is strong. It's true. You've been tested. Uh, and Abraham renamed the whole place Jehovah-Jireh, which means the Lord sees or the Lord promises. In other words, it's not like earlier in his life you'd say to Abraham, hey, do you think that the Lord sees or do you think the Lord makes promises? He'd always said, yeah, I know that. But here he discovered it in a powerful way. where He learned a dimension about God that he had not previously understood or known. Okay, so how do we think about this in our own lives? Okay, if, if faith obeys God, no matter what, let's just think about, I'm going to give you four examples from different Bible verses that I think at times we, we see what God is saying, but it's a challenge because we feel differently at times. So let's look at this first one from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. We studied this about a month ago, looking at the life of Enoch. Remember, he walked with God every day, and God took him home to be with him. And it tells us in Hebrews 11, chapter 6, that those who walk by faith, they must believe God, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those, or that he rewards those who seek him. Or I like the way the New King James Version says it says, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we know that, right? We're like, yeah, it's good to pray, it's good to read the Bible, it's good to seek the Lord to spend time with him. But can you imagine moments where you don't feel like that's true? Like maybe imagine the, you, you're like, you go to bed, and you say, you know, tomorrow I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake up early and I'm going to spend time reading the Bible. I'm going to spend time praying. Imagine how you feel when that alarm clock goes off. You know, the feeling contradicts what the Word says. The feeling says, no, you know what is actually rewarding? The snooze button, yo. <laughs> That's what <laughs> is actually rewarding, you know. You know what's actually rewarding? Closing my Bible right now and just getting on my screen and just scrolling through. That's what's actually rewarding. You see, that's one of those places where it's, there's that challenge. He rewards those who seek him versus you know, the feeling or the experience of our lives. But our part is to obey, and God's part is to fulfill his promise. Let's look at another one. Matthew 6, verse 33. Matthew 6, verse 33. Jesus said here that we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other, you know, earthly affairs, our provision, they will be uh, provided for us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So we know that the top priority of our lives as believers should be the kingdom, the kingdom of God and the pursuit of growth, spiritual maturity, righteousness. But we're challenged with that. When there's the temptation, for instance, to put in a 70-hour week at work. You know, because we feel like, man, I got to do this for myself. I got to do this for my family. I got to do this. I don't have time for Christian fellowship. I don't have time for being with the body of believers. Or we're challenged with this. I mean, a lot of you who are raising children right now in this modern climate and world, you experience this challenge and pressure when the little league coach says, hey, we got practice on Sunday morning. I'm no legalist with this kind of thing. I know the Big Sur Marathon's happening right now, you know, and I've always said there's going to come a year where Pastor Nate is running in the Big Sur Marathon. <laughs> that will happen, you know, but, but in my family, at least, we've always tried to practice, hey, we have church services all day long. If something does come up, we, we, we try to preserve that Sunday morning time and experience together as a family, but if there's like, there is no way out of it, you know, kind of thing, we'll be there Sunday night. Because we believe that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto us. But there will be experiences that come into our lives that challenge the promises of God. Or here's another one, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. The Lord tells us, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, what he's not saying here is don't be a friend with a non-believer. Jesus was friends with non-believers. He, he loved people. He cares about people who don't yet know him. He wants them to know him, but he cares about them. He loves them. But this is speaking of a, a deeper connection. You know, something like marriage. 
over and over again. I mean, one of the biggest troubles that got the people of Israel into trouble over and over again in the Old Testament era was marrying people who didn't believe like they believed. And when I was, you know, coming up and I was praying like, Lord, I'd like to be married someday. Would you provide that for me? My big prayer was, would you bring someone into my life who loves Jesus more than they love me? And what I meant by that was not, I hope they love Jesus so little and then they like barely love me. What I wanted was them for to love me like, I wanted them to love me like crazy, but I wanted Jesus to be bigger, more important. I just couldn't fathom how life could go forward with the way that I wanted to prioritize the Lord, the way I wanted to spend money, the way I wanted to use my time and energy. I just couldn't imagine being yoked together with someone who didn't share that value. And God has just so blessed me with a wife who is more passionate about the kingdom of God than I am. But though the Lord says this to us, we've felt this before in a time of loneliness or where we just want that human connection. We're tempted to compromise at times. But the Lord is saying, look, Trust me. Have faith in me. Obey me even when that contradictory experience is there. Here's one more I'll give to you. Colossians 4 verse 1 tells masters to treat your bondservants justly and fairly. Treat your bondservants justly and fairly. Now, none of you have bondservants, but some of you are in positions of authority where you have employees. And you're te- you could be tempted at times to cut corners, to not pay them a fair wage because you have your own needs to take care of. But in that moment, you've got to do what is right. That was Abraham. He had faith in God no matter what. He obeyed God no matter what because he believed God no matter what. Okay, so those are some of the ways that Abraham's faith, I think, impacts our experience today. But let's move on to our next character, can we? You guys cool with that? Let's go to the next guy, Isaac, Abraham's son, Isaac, who, you know, he lived the rest of his life with the memory of that special trip that him and his dad took together. (laughs) Sure he had some issues with that one. But, okay, verse 20, it says, By faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. All these guys, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, their lives are recorded for us in the book of Genesis. If you want to go back and read the book of Genesis, you could read of all of their lives, all four of their lives. Isaac, though, when you come to his life, though there are things that you learn about him, you don't learn a lot about him. He has the shortest, even though he lived longer than the rest of them, he has the shortest accounting of his life. It's about two and a half chapters long. So I'll tell you something about myself, but one of my favorite movies all-time favorite movies, one of my all-time favorite movies, is the Lego movie. Have you guys seen the Lego movie? <laughs> Tells you a lot about me, that that's where my humor is at. But the main character, his name's Emmett, and he's just kind of a bland kind of guy. And there comes this moment where they're, all his friends are caught on camera testifying what they know about him, and they don't know anything. One guy says, we, I know like zippy zap about that guy. And then the coffee shop barista says, he's just kind of a, hmm? <laughs> kind of a blank slate is what he says. And that's how I feel about Isaac. He's just kind of like that. You know, you, you come to his story, it's like, I don't really know who you are, what you're about, what drives you. What we do know is that he married a woman named Rebecca. They needed to have children because God's promise was through Isaac's line. They couldn't. He prayed, though, for Rebecca. She became pregnant, and she became pregnant with twins. And God gave her a prophecy during her pregnancy that those two baby boys would turn into, that their offspring would become two great nations, and that the older his nation and in his life would be lesser than, subservient to, the younger brother. And this is exactly what happened historically. Esau was born first, Jacob born second, Esau 
his people group became the Edomites. Jacob, his people group, Jacob was actually renamed Israel at one point. They became the people of Israel, and the Edomites were uh, historically subservient to, second fiddle to the people of Israel, and often persecutors of the people of Israel as well. So this was the thing that God had said, the, the, the lesser or the, the second born will actually receive the greater blessing. So Rebecca knew this. And these two boys, they couldn't have been more different from each other. You know, you go back to the story, Esau was a man, he was, a, he was an outdoors guy. You know, he, he, he went hunting all the time, he, he just was comfortable in nature, he was just a rough raw kind of guy. And, and he had like a look that accommodated that as well. He was, uh, he was hairy, he was super hairy, the Bible says. So hairy that his dad one time, when, when he was deceived, his dad felt animal skin. And he's like, oh, that's Esau. <laughs> okay, so he was a hairy dude. Jacob, though, was a, was a, was a more moderate kind of guy. It says, the Bible says that he liked to live inside the tents. He didn't like to come outside. And uh, he was, uh, uh, was smooth-skinned, soft-spoken. That was Jacob. You know, he liked his video games and, you know, <laughs> just being inside, you know, kind of thing and reading fine literature, you know. Like, they were just very different. They were both men, but they were just very different. All right, a moment came, though, when Isaac was older. Uh, well, a moment came when, he, when they were both older that uh, Jacob and Esau, where, where Esau came home from a hunting trip and Jacob had been cooking some stew, and Esau smelled it, and he said, it smells so good, I want it. Jacob said, what will you give me for it? He said, will you give me your birthright? And Esau, he was just such a man of the flesh and, the, and like the moment, he's like, yeah, I'll get, I'll, I want that soup so bad. I'll give you my birthright. And that seems to have become common knowledge in the family, that, that that transaction had taken place. So fast forward years later, Isaac gets to the point where he feels like he's about to die. He, he actually didn't. He lived many more years, but he thought his day had come. He was going blind. He couldn't see very well. And so he called Isaac, and, or excuse me, he called Esau, and he said, Esau, go out, go hunting, go on one of your classic hunting trips and get me some game, and come home, and cook it, and make me a feast, and I'll eat it, and then I'll give you the blessing of the firstborn. It's what fathers would do in that era. Rebecca heard it, though, and when Esau left, she pulled Jacob aside, and she said, hey, you know God said, you know, the promise is supposed to be for you. Your dad just said he's going to give it to Esau. We got to trick him. So they created this whole plan. They created a meal together all quick. Esau's out there, you know, like for days with the sniper rifle just waiting or whatever. And Jacob just makes a meal all quick. And then he's like, I don't, I don't sound like my brother. I don't look like my brother. I don't smell like my brother, you know. So they put on Esau's clothes and they put animal skins on his arms and on the back of his neck. And he comes in and talks to Isaac, and Isaac's like, who are you? You don't sound like Esau. He comes closer, and he smells him, feels him. He says, but you feel like Esau, and you smell like Esau, and he, and they, he pronounces a blessing on Jacob. Here's a, a thing you need to know. Jacob didn't need Isaac's blessing because after he stole the blessing from Esau, Esau wanted to kill him, so he had to run for his life. And his first night out on the run, he had a vision from God, and God said, I will bless you. He didn't need his dad's blessing. God would give him the blessing. He didn't need to manipulate it. But this was the whole family scene. And so then he, Isaac blesses Jacob. Jacob goes out. Isaac's sitting there, you know, blind, and he's thinking, I just blessed Esau. Then Esau comes in later, and he's got a meal. And he's like, Dad, here I am. Bless me. And he says, who are you? He says, I'm Esau. And the Bible says that Isaac started to tremble greatly. He was so upset that he had been duped. And he says, I, it's too late. I already pronounced the blessing on your brother. I've got another smaller blessing for you, but I can't give you that blessing of the firstborn. Okay, that's the story. And here's what it says in 
Hebrews 11, verse 20, by faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. Like By reading that, you'd think that there was this moment where they both got older, Isaac got older, and he's like, you know what, guys, this is what God said. God said that Jacob would be blessed first, Esau would be blessed second, and so that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to submit to the will of God. But that's not at all what happened in the Old Testament story. It seems that what occurred is that after the blessings had become irreversible in Isaac's mind, eventually he came to a place where he submitted to God's plan. He had his plan, he had his thing, he had his desires, but he eventually came to a place where he says, God, you're right, and I'm going to submit to you. That's what faith does. Faith submits to God. Faith submits to God. And this is important for us to know because we often argue with God. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. It says in Isaiah 45, verse 9, Woe to the one who argues with his maker. One clay pot among many. Does the clay say to the one forming it, What are you making? But this is so often what we're like. We're like that clay pot being fashioned by a potter saying, what do you think you're making, Potter? I know better than you. I know better than you what decisions should be made, what you should be doing in my life. But faith comes to a place where it ceases to fight against God and it simply submits itself to God. You see, we often believe that we are better at decision making than God is. And that if we had our way, we would do things quite differently. And I'm sure we would. But we must come to a place where we understand that God's decisions for our lives are better than what we might decide. We must accept God's path for our lives. We must stop fighting and accept who God has made us to be. But some of us would say, God, I don't like that you made me to look this way. I don't like that you gave me the mind that you gave to me. I feel fragile. I don't like the family that you put me in. I don't like the education that I received. I don't like the opportunities that were in front of me. I don't like these things. You should have done better, God. But Isaac came to a point where he says, you know, God, I want to submit myself to your plan. It might not be what I would have chosen myself, but I believe that your way is best. I want to talk to those of you who are parents for just a moment. In the raising of your children, one of the things that you need to do if, you're, if they're in your home still is, is you need to teach them about obedience. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Now what that doesn't mean is that you're to take Ephesians 6 verse 1 and show it to your kids and be like, see, like do that, do better. You, you just need to do better. It says obey me, get going, you know. It's not what it means. It was read in the congregation. Often the children weren't even there, but the parents were there. They were meant to hear that what my child needs for me to teach, like of all the things that they need, and there's many things a child needs to learn, but one of the paramount things they need to learn is they need to learn about obedience. And here's why. It takes obedience and submission to be successful in life, for one. But it especially takes submission to God to be successful in life. We've got to learn how to bend our will to the will of God. So Isaac, he came to that place. All right, let's move on to our third character, this man named Jacob. It says in verse 21, By faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Now we already looked a little bit at Jacob's life when we looked at Isaac's life. Uh, And after he received that blessing, after he stole it from his dad, uh, Esau was livid. Isaac eventually died. But, but, But Jacob felt fearful for his own life, so he went away. He, he ran away. 
And he went on a wild adventure with God. He lived with his uncle Laban. He eventually became a polygamist, which you know was a thing in that era. God didn't approve, but they did it anyways. And so he had a bunch of children. They became the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel in the future. Uh, but he went through a lot of trials. One day he finally met Pharaoh at the end of his life, and he said, few and evil have been the days of my life. You know, he just he suffered. And one of the big things that he suffered was that he had a favorite son. Like, you shouldn't do that, but he did that. He had a favored child. And uh, he made it really obvious. He gave him a rainbow-colored jacket and made him in charge of his older siblings and stuff. Like, it just was not a good parenting move. And all the older siblings became jealous just because of that. And then God gave Joseph these dreams. And Joseph told everybody these dreams. He probably should have just kept them to himself. But the dreams basically communicated, I'm going to be in charge of all of you one day. <laughs> and so he tells them these dreams. They just hated Joseph. So one day they had an opportunity and they sold him into slavery. But rather than telling Jacob we sold him into slavery, they took his jacket, the coat of many colors, they put animal blood on it. They said, Dad, we found this in the field. So Jacob was led to believe for many years that Joseph had died in some kind of accident out in the field. And so he lived with that for many years. Meanwhile, his son Joseph was actually alive and through certain turns of events that God orchestrated in his life became the number two man in all of Egypt. So he was very powerful and prosperous, but he thought he's dead. Jacob thought he's dead, but he was actually doing quite well. But he suffered. He suffered. But what you see here is at the end of his life, he came to a place where he knew, I'm about to die, and he was actually about to die. And he blessed all his sons, said different pronouncements about their future upon each one of them. Some were blessings, some weren't as much blessings, if you go back and read it. But when he came to Joseph, he actually, he did later pronounce a blessing on Joseph, but the thing that he did first was he said, I'm going to bless your sons, Joseph. So it was his grandsons. So it was grandpa time. Jacob with these two sons of Joseph, and their names were Ephraim and Manasseh. And when he blessed them, he actually crossed his arms over to communicate, I'm going to bless the younger above the older. That's what I'm going to do. Just like what was done for me with Jacob and Esau, that's what I'm going to do for Ephraim and Manasseh. And they actually became two great tribes in Israel. But what it says here was that when he did that, he was bowing in worship, verse 21, over the head of his staff. He had this staff that he had to use because he had wrestled with God at a previous episode in his life, and God touched his hip to get him to surrender. He, he had to get slowed down by God. You ever been there? And so he had this staff for the rest of his life, and at the end of his life, he's, he's got nothing, he's just got his family there, he's just this old man, and he's about to, it's, the Bible says it very beautifully, he's about to put his feet up in the bed and die. And the last thing he does, leaning on this staff, is he blesses and he's worshiping God as he does so. Okay, so what's the significance of that? Well, the significance is really simple. During Jacob's whole life, what he wanted more than anything was God's blessing. Let me read this to you. I'll put it on the screen for you. From when he received a vision from God earlier in his life of this ladder coming up and down filled with these angels coming onto his life. God basically said, I'm going to bless you. And Jacob made a vow after that dream and said, or vision and said, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. So he like makes this deal. He's like, if God does all these things for me, then he'll be my God. If he does his deal, then I'm going to bless him by being his follower, <laughs> You know, was kind of the idea. Later in Genesis 32, when he wrestled with God, the Lord said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And we could go through half a dozen scriptures like this from the life of Jacob where that's what he wanted more than anything. I want the stuff God gives. I want 
the blessings God gives. That's what I want more than anything. But at the end of his life, he figured it out. And what he figured out was that it wasn't about the blessings, but it was about the blesser. What he figured out at the end of his life was that in God, he had the best possession that anyone could ever have. You see, this is what faith does. Faith worships only God. Faith figures out that there's more to life than the stuff that sometimes even God gives. You see, a lot of times we get caught up in the good things and we forget the best thing, God. And I've watched a lot of people over time whose life has deteriorated because when things were good, they forgot about God. God was taking care of them, providing for them, blessing them, and in the course of that kind of life, they forgot all about the Lord. But the Lord looks at us and says, don't you see me? Yeah, your your relationships can be great, your family can be great, your career can be great, but in the midst of all that greatness, do not forget me. Remember that I am the greatest possession that you could ever have. I think we need this reminder Many of us, because, you know, for a lot of us, like, you know, we we all go through trials, but for many of us, life is pretty good. You know, the sun's shining last week on the Monterey Peninsula, you know, and you're just like going out and everything's all green and beautiful and stuff like that. It just feels like this is a great life. Yeah, I got troubles and pressures and all that kind of stuff, but it's a pretty cool life. But don't let that lull you to sleep into thinking that's what life is all about. It's not. There's God. He's he's your greatest possession. All right, briefly, let's look at our last character, verse 22. It says, By faith Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. All right, the life of Joseph, the book of Genesis says a lot about it. If, if, you, if Joseph is a friend of yours, then you don't expect this is what is going to be said. You're, you expect it to say, by faith, Joseph endured his slavery. By faith, Joseph went into prison but believed God. By faith, Joseph believed the dreams that God gave to him when he was a younger man and held tight to them and then eventually ascended to the number two position in all of Egypt. By faith, Joseph prospered and believed God. By faith, Joseph forgave his brothers as he unearthed that they felt sorrowful over what they had done and gave them an opportunity to be reunited to him. By faith, Joseph did all of these things. By faith, Joseph didn't take revenge when he could have taken revenge. You might expect that it would say something like that, but here's what it says. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. This is what happened. At the end of Joseph's life, He's about to die, and he tells everybody, he says, hey, look, I never lived in Canaan. And God told my great-great-grandfather Abraham that he would give our family Canaan, the promised land, that we would live there someday. And I never even hung out there. I've been over here kicking it in Egypt all these years. So when I die, take my bones and do not bury them permanently. Put them in a box, put them in a coffin, whatever. But when you all go back to the promised land, when you go there, bring my bones with you. I might not have lived in Canaan, but my bones will. That's kind of what he was saying. And for 400 years, his coffin was a sermon. Preaching to the people of Israel and saying, There's a better day coming. It's the promised land. Now look, when he first said it, life was good in Egypt. There was like no reason to leave for the people of Israel. They got the prime real estate because the Egyptians had all these superstitions about shepherds and stuff like that. So the people of Israel got this prime real estate where they could just go about their business. They were thriving financially. They just were having babies, growing families becoming a nation of people. And when he said it, there was no reason to leave. But even when life was good, Joseph's like, but it could be gooder. (laughs) 
It could be better than this. Because the life of faith says, look, when things are bad, it could be better with God. But even when things are good, life could be better with God. God has a better, more promising future in store for us. When I was praying about this sermon this last week, one part of our church that came into my mind was, you know, we have a a men's and women's home called The Bridge that our church supports. Pastor Mike Casey and his wife Michelle run it, and it's a beautiful ministry. And I was thinking about men and women that I've seen over the years who come into that program, and God begins to bless their lives. They start getting their, their clear thinking back again as they you know, if they were on drugs before or alcohol before, they begin to, you know, become clear-minded. God begins blessing them. Relationships start getting restored, you know, things like that. And you get seven or eight months in, and you might be thinking to yourself, you know, this is good. But what you've got to have is a perspective that says, but with the Lord. If I continue to walk with him, it will get even better. You see, that's what faith says. Faith believes that because so often when things get good, that's when we turn from the Lord. Jonathan Edwards, in the first sermon he ever preached, he made three points. He said, our bad things turn out for good, our good things can never be lost, and the best things are yet to come. This is what a believer is confident about. So with all these people, you know, their great statements of faith, the way that they felt, the way that they operated before the Lord, We now know this. They had to figure these things out through the totality of their lives, and some of these confessions they only made at the end of their lives. But now we get to look at them and say, that's what you said at the end of your life. I'm at the stage of life I'm in right now today. I can take the lesson you learned, and I can apply it to my life right now so that I don't have to learn that lesson at the very end. I can learn it then for sure, but I can learn it right now today. So Abraham, he looks at all of us today and he says, faith obeys no matter what. Isaac looks at us and says, faith submits to God. Jacob says, faith worships God alone. And Joseph would stand here today and he would say to us, there is always a better day coming for those who have faith in God. All right, I went a little long today, so I'm just going to close in prayer and uh, ask for God's blessing on us that he would help us to live this life of faith. Father, we thank you for this faith that you have provided a way for us to walk and operate in. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to live this life of faith more and more. Lord, strengthen us, we pray. And for the areas, Lord, where we have not obeyed, submitted, worshiped, We've gotten caught up in the moment of today rather than believing in what you're doing in the future. Forgive us, Lord, cleanse us, and help us, Lord, to be people of faith afresh. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. May your blessing be upon all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, God bless you, church. Have a great week.